I'm Angie. And I'm Jamie. Taking care of your mental health is the key to happiness. But sometimes even the best superheroes lose their keys. I bet you're wondering why we are dressed like superheroes. Yeah, I, I'm wondering why. It's because therapists truly are superheroes. Superheroes don't sweat. Stop it. This superhero does. His idea was spandex. I'm looking at you, Angie. Okay, I, yes, and I don't necessarily have the body for it, but that doesn't matter because your self-worth is not wrapped up in what society says. Welcome to the shrink show. Get on my back. Look at it rise into the occasion. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> what are we talking about? Trauma. <laughs> okay, do we want to talk about trauma? Sure, why not? All talk right. How feelings are connected. Let's talk about trauma before the holidays. Yeah. Ah. It could invoke a trauma response. Actually, majority, I told all my That's clients. That's huge. Um, it's the beginning of December and basically mid-November through December, all we do is talk about. So you're going to go see your family. Let's plan on how to cope with it because it's igniting a lot of childhood emotions, feelings, beliefs, um, seeing people that bring up emotions, feelings, beliefs. Or people that victimized you. Yep. Like for my students that I work with that all of them have experienced trauma, a lot of times for many of them, if they have um, sexual abuse that maybe they've not told anybody about, it's around the holidays that they mm -hmm. get re-victimized again and again and again because yeah. they're around the perpetrator. Well, and for your students, they're not at school for two to three weeks. Right, so, so they have no one to talk to. They have no to. one to talk to. They have no outlet or escape. So if at home they get abused, their caregiver isn't going to care about whether or not they leave a bruise yeah. because they have no one to go tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it is. It's a scary time. And I do think on that trauma spectrum... Of, you know, I, I hate that the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, basically the therapist's Bible, um, for those of you who don't speak that language. Well, and it's, and it's everybody in the medical field. You use it to diagnose. Mental health yeah. diagnoses. Physical health, yeah. Right. And so the, the DSM has PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I think that is great for those who truly meet the criteria. But one of the things that I find at the school I work at is every single one of my students has experienced what I consider a traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And as a level three school, they're getting kicked out of public school mm -hmm. because they are displaying really big and bold behaviors because of what I, I attribute to that traumatic experience. They don't know how else to release mm -hmm. those emotions, those feelings, those losses, whatever that is. And yet I can tell you probably 5% of them have been diagnosed with PTSD. Well, and technically speaking, you can't be diagnosed unless you're over 18. Oh, I've seen plenty of kids diagnosed with PTSD. Yeah. But I mean... Plenty is in 5%. But yeah. in the grand scheme the of things... five 5% of those kids. Yeah. But see, that's, that's even more messed up. Because then, for my students, you're getting... You, you diagnose them with ADHD, which looks mm -hmm. extremely similar to PTSD. Yeah. And then you medicate them. And yeah. then what do we know about that? We know mm -hmm. if you are given medication for ADHD and you don't actually have ADHD... That can increase your chances of having addictive behaviors later on in life. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, what do we know about trauma? Let's, you know, talk about how that can increase your chances of addi addictive behaviors. It's mm -hmm. like as a society where... Well, you're self-medicating. You ta you're taught. You just start medicating yourself. Yeah. Right. So you're then we're, we're not actually treating what it is. And I wish the DSM had... Something for children like an, specific to PTSD. Well, I wish they had <laughs> an adjustment disorder for trauma. Mm -hmm. Like, um, So for those of you who may not be familiar, an adjustment disorder is, let's say um, I, my, uh, my parent dies. 
and I'm very sad, which is a normal level of sad, Mm -hmm. right? And then six months later, I am still the same level of sad as I was at the beginning when they died. And it's like, I'm still unable to eat or um, function function. at work. Yeah, do the basic things. Mm -hmm. Now it's starting to look more like an adjustment disorder with depressed mood, Mm -hmm. right? Because I am having a really difficult time adjusting to this life life change change. or Mm -hmm. stressor or whatever has been presented. Yeah. And so it's just, I just need your help, help as a, you know, if I were to go to a therapist, I just need your help working through this life change. Mm -hmm. I wish they had that for trauma. I feel like that would be so much easier. But I feel like the way I personally define trauma, that would make so much sense because Mm -hmm. trauma is simply, it's, it's an experience but you perceive it as negative. Right. So it's a negative life experience. That is impacting your future. That's affecting you. Well, it's affecting you at this moment, even though that experience isn't at this moment happening. Mm. Right? Because it's subjective. So like you and I could have the same type of car accident, but right. it could affect me differently than you. You could just move on with life and I could be like, I can't Ever drive. drive. I can't go to that intersection. You know, it's it's too triggering or I'm feeling like I will start to have anxiety symptoms. I'll start to, like, I'm not my normal self. I can't leave my house. I don't feel safe driving, right? So I just define traumas. It's just a negative life experience. And every, and that in that sense, everybody has them. Right. And, and I, because I think trauma is such a, it's a loaded word that's mm-hmm. been passed around so much that people take it personal if they say like, oh, that's my trauma. Or it's used so much that you're like, it takes away the, vali- like, validity. the validity and like, and the intensity that it actually is. Because I think people also negate their own trauma by saying, oh, well, it wasn't that bad because like, yeah, I like I had one one time where someone scared me when I was dating them, but I was never hit. So it wasn't that bad. Like people have to justify their trauma if it wasn't that bad. Like I, I was, you know, dating somebody and I said, no, I didn't want to have sex, but they chose to have sex anyway. Is that trauma? I'm not saying this personally. I'm saying those are examples. And, And so often I've heard people say, well, that's, that's not, I mean, I, I didn't tell him like, no, I didn't, I didn't stop him. Mm-hmm. Well, but, but that can still be trauma or, mm-hmm. you know, for, for me, one of my traumatic things was not having my dad around, but often that is not seen as trauma because he's just never been around. How could I be traumatized by somebody who's not even been there, mm-hmm. but it affected my mental ability to see myself through the beautiful lens that we all should see ourselves through Mm -hmm. or my ability to trust and feel confident in who I can or can't be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then I think this leads us into how emotions get stirred up into the trauma Mm. or into that that definition again of the subjective negative life experience because the way I explain it to clients is our emotions have a beginning and a middle and an end so like the beginning would be like I get in a car accident and I'm scared I'm like maybe physical pain Numb. I'm confused and And then the middle would be me like telling the story like, oh my gosh, and then this happened and like me just trying to wrap my head around how this car came out of here. And then as I'm telling it, I'm like, oh my gosh, now I'm feeling really sad and I'm actually feeling really anxious because now I'm realizing I that was really scary. Like I I could have died or something really like terrifying could have happened. And so then like I'm feeling sad now and overwhelmed. But then as I keep telling the story and as I just allow myself to feel these feelings to the point where I can now tell you the full story, beginning, middle, and end of that car accident and the healing process, and now I'm driving again and still going by that intersection, but I feel, quote unquote, feel in my body, my body feels neutral. 
So that means I've reached the end of that emotion because I've allowed myself to experience the full depth of that feeling. Yes, it started off with maybe scared, but it also like went down, uh, you know, all the other emotions that come with it, that came with the thoughts, the beliefs, you know, the thought I could have died, the thought, you know, what if I should have done this, that guilt and what, It's you know, almost like a grief process. Yeah. You know, what are the, I never remember the seven stages of grief. What are they like denial and it, it and ends with acceptance and, and yeah. But even an example of, you know, if somebody, if you're, spouse cheats on you and you trusted them with all that you are and you know maybe you responded with betrayal and then it turned into um acceptance Mm -hmm. right like oh it's fine I'm fine I'm fine and then never reached that like angry pain stage because sometimes there are those times where it's like we try so hard to not feel those feelings. Like I don't Mm -hmm. want to feel sad. Yeah. I don't want to feel that anger because it's so painful. I mean, I've had colleagues say, I don't want to watch that movie or I don't want to listen to this song because it'll make me cry. Or they've Mm -hmm. like walked out of my office if I've asked a question because they're going through something and they're like, I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't have time to cry right now. And yeah, and, and that's an unfinished emotion right there. Right. And I always say, okay, that is fine. As long as you will find time to cry later. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I used to put on sad movies just to cry. Because sometimes I think people think in order for me to heal from one event, I have to specifically be thinking about that event mm-hmm. and crying about that event. Right. I say nay. No. <laughs> I, there are times where I have taken a bath and I've legit cried for an hour and I have no fucking idea what I, what the fuck I've cried about, but I know I have released Mm -hmm. things that needed to be released and I felt better and I felt more whole when I was done taking a bath. Right. Like we don't have to know. I'll watch a sad movie like fucking Frozen or (laughs) a sad cartoon like Moana. Damn Pixar movies. God. They They must have a therapist on staff because those new Pixar movies. All of them. We're going to have to do episodes on each Pixar movie. Oh my God. I love it. Truly. We could. Like fucking Um, Toy Story. You want to fucking tug at my heartstrings? Oh my God. Oh my God. The journey that they go through? Stop it. I'm pretty sure. Like, I mean, my favorite until the most, I feel like the newest one, the the fourth one, Mm -hmm. right? Was like its own. It's like its own category because it came out it significantly is. later. So I'm gonna give it that. But, but it still was another journey, right. like Woody's but journey the, of life. But the third one, I remember, <gasps> I was just sobbed. I just was watching it alone in my apartment at the time and just bawling, just like, oh, oh my god, just I, hysterical. Oh my, the emotions, the feels. Oh my, and like he grows up. And so I learned long ago oh I gosh. can't watch cartoons with people. <laughs> because I mean, I'm gonna ugly cry. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna ugly fucking cry every goddamn time. Every time. But you know just what? Me every time. It's also, it's healing. Right. It's healing well, something within me. And everything you shared is perfect because you're sharing things like how how we stop our emotions from reaching the end. Because what I just shared was the perfect world, quote unquote. But you've caught on. I have to go to work, so I can't keep telling my story over and over again. I can't cry when I feel sad about my car accident. So I, you know, I've got to go to this meeting. I need to look professional. I need to have my shit together. Or so, fuck, what if you're a therapist and somebody comes in and they're talking about their car accident? Yeah. I right? You can't start bawling. Off. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that'd be a different type of therapy session, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so I just, I, I always say we stop our emotions because of things like that. Or sometimes we don't want to feel, we, we stop. That we I think stay, happens a lot more. We stay too busy. We preoccupy ourselves with things like cleaning with our kids. Mm-hmm. We preoccupy our things with things that we think, quote unquote, we're controlling by controlling that rather than feeling our feelings. Or I'm going to throw in this now. Social media. Mm-hmm. That is the perfect the best avoider right ever. now. And and yeah. that truly has been... I, I think the reason we're in an age of a mental health crisis, honestly, 
is because of the creation of social media. We can, I can legit TikTok Mm -hmm. for hours and I never have to think my own thoughts. Right. I never have to sit alone with myself. I never have to be confronted with who I am in an uncomfortable situation because Mm -hmm. I am living vicariously through every single life I see. Well, and not only that, but it was getting into the other way that we don't finish our emotions is sometimes our brain does this on its own. It dissociates. So like the extreme, extreme version would be a dissociative identity disorder, which is, you know, the the newer classification of multiple personality disorder. There we go. Oh, but I had that one from um, my own abuse. Right. You as didn't a, remember. Right. A repressed memory that came right. out. And that's dissociating. Dissociating is your brain protects you. Your brain, it does it as a form of protection. It thinks, well, this is too much for Jamie to keep retelling this. We're going to act like it didn't even happen. So she can, she needs to stay alive. We need her to drive to work today. So we're going to have her pretend, quote unquote, she can't remember this. And, you know, when. And there is a benefit to that. Well, our brain naturally does it all the time. If you've daydreamed, you've, you've been in a state of trance you've been in a state of dissociation Mm -hmm. and and social media social media is a state of dissociating it is because you are in the emotions of whatever you're watching and there have been so many studies now that the level of dopamine that your brain goes through like it gets a high because it's getting overstimulated because that's why it feels addictive that's why we are constantly checking our phones and like checking our notifications because it's very you get that high it's, positive euphoric effect. It's the new And then drug. when you get let down because, oh, they're actually, I had, I thought it was a phantom ding dong. It didn't actually text message or give me that notification. And so then, then you, you're let down. You're, you never reach that high. So that's why you keep going back for it because you're looking for the high. Or, but ooh, you're how many likes should I get? How many? Right? Or even actual getting high, like using substances, drinking, using drugs. Like, I'll drink to that. Yeah, I'll drink to that. <laughs> Drinking gin and tonic with your friend and saying it's quote unquote podcasting. <laughs> That's a level of dissociating. <laughs> or is it self care? You know, I'm you gonna... be the judge. <laughs> this, that'll be our poll. Is this show us dissociating, <laughs> or is this show self care, <laughs> or is this show? Hiding from our families for the only brief time that we can. I just thank my drinking. husband for babysitting. Mm-hmm. Hopefully he keeps the kids alive. You're Hopefully. doing a great job, Kurt. You're doing great. We love you. <laughs> chirp, chirp. <laughs> um, no, I, and I think all of that brings up really great points. And and it, one of the one of the benefits that I have with my job is I see those effects on young minds. And as a parent myself of a teenager, I and and elementary kids, it's very difficult already to navigate the amount of time they should and shouldn't have on social media. Well, they're not on social media. You know, <laughs> um, follow Juno on her. My two-year-old on TikTok. <laughs> she is outrageous with her. Posts. Actually, she would be fucking hilarious and probably have all the followers, but. It, it is difficult to know how much time to allow them, especially when at school they use iPads yeah, and computers. Yeah. And it's then you throw time. in yeah. trauma. Like, I'll give an example. My 15-year-old is my stepson. And, I mean, I look at you as though you don't know this, but um, my 15-year-old is my stepson. I assume you're talking to them, <laughs> listener. And... Um, three years ago, fuck, three and a half years ago, it was July of 2019. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. That's three and a half years, right? Jesus. Yeah. Do you see that math counting Ooh, on my fingers? Yeah. You guys, three, saw it. three and a half years ago, his mom died. Mm-hmm. And that was a whole, oh, and a month prior, I found out I was pregnant with our youngest. So that was real fun. <laughs> You um, rocked his world. Thanks. He, he had a, so a lot of life changes. this was this was a huge 
huge change for all of us. And, and honestly, even though his mom and I's relationship was, um, I don't want to say tumultuous. That's not the right word was, uh, strained. I think would be a better word. Even though his mom and I's relationship was strained, um, he had always known me as, as mom and trying to navigate his trauma and his healing and his wanting to avoid and go down this social media uh, hidden in his room, not wanting to talk, not wanting to bring up his mom because he didn't want to cry. Like I felt really bad because I would like make him cry almost every morning on the way to school. And I'm like, I'm not trying to make you cry, baby. Like, I'm really not. But I also... <laughs> but seriously, you need to get this You out. need to cry. I also yeah. knew that if he didn't... I knew him well enough to know if he did not release it immediately in this moment, he would never come back to it. Mm-hmm. Because that's the way his brain works. His brain is, yeah. And so I would force him to talk about it. He'd be like, I don't want to talk about it. I'm like, well, but we need to talk about your mom. Let's talk about her. Like, let's... It's just, you know, chitty chat about your mom, you know, <laughs> it wasn't that casual, but it, it would, it would end in arguments. It would end in him crying. It would end in me crying, feeling like I don't know how to help him. I like, I'm a fucking therapist and I am like, I'm making him cry every fucking morning before school. I'm a terrible mom. I'm such an asshole. But what I can say is now he can jump in the car or come home after school and be like, you know what I was thinking about today? It's Monday. My mom and I used to have macaroni Mondays. Do you think we could do macaroni Mondays? Hell to the fucking yeah, bud. Or, hey, I was thinking, gosh, about the trip my mom and I took. Let's talk about blah, blah, blah. Um, And it was, it's just been so good for him to, I don't know, be able to talk about that because he was forced to release it. Mm -hmm. But now he can do it on his own. Right. Now he can bring it up on his own. Because even when he's bringing up those stories, it's invoking an emotion, Mm -hmm. but he talking about it for him and however he gets emotions out, it's getting that emotion out. Because I think that's the thing about grief too and loss is, is the idea that it's not necessarily stages or phases, just like emotions. It's you grow deeper into it. You grow through the spectrum of, of you know what, I like, like the utter despair and loss of the shock of the first of it. But now fast forward to three years later, it's he's three years in and he can feel like it's so sad that I don't have macaroni Mondays. And I can still... I can still that. hold space and for me, for my mom, for the happiness and sadness by redoing it in this new way with my family the way it looks now. Mm. And that comes with new emotions, yes. But the fact that he's able to hold those new emotions tells me he is processing emotions. Mm-hmm. Because he st- it still comes with sadness because he remembers. It still comes with whatever other feeling that feels right for him. Mm-hmm. he's doing that. And I think that's what grief and loss is, is it's a spectrum. It's never over. It's right. It grows deeper and more in depth the longer we go through that feeling. Yes. Because you're going to feel, so that beginning, middle, end, you're going to feel that emotion again, but you're going to start over from the beginning now, and it's going to feel differently because you have the memory, the experience of that that initial sadness. But now I go, I feel sad again, but it feels different because I finished that last one and now I'm picking it up this new way and it feels a little different, feels a little deeper, feels a little lighter, feels comes with other memories maybe, mm-hmm. and that's okay. But the difference is, is he is feeling them to their end because it sounds like he's still leaving, leaving at its end. He's not coming back like, with there's there's something still unfinished. Well, or... maybe it's just the release of knowing that they can end. Yeah. And knowing that he can be a part of that. That 
I think sometimes with trauma, with loss, which loss, I think often grief is not always lumped in with trauma, but in in my opinion, Negative it very life much experience fits is my definition. Yeah, because again, my not having my dad in my life, that was loss. It was as though he had died and was never around. That was a huge loss for me. Right. It was a relationship I desired that wasn't there. Right. But if we can work through that, then the next time it presents itself, we know our own power. Right. We know our own strength. We know how tough we truly are. And there's so often that people are so afraid that they're going to break that they avoid it at all costs. Right. I'm going to avoid all of those feelings because there's no way I can ever come back. Right. And what they don't people realize. People don't know that feelings end though. That's those people. Yes. I think. I, that's where I'm like, it does end. I promise it ends. It ends. And it, and it doesn't what, mean you're not going to feel it again, but you now have the knowledge mm-hmm. of not only does it end, but it will feel different because it's a fresh emotion. Because when it's unfinished... Mm. That's where I feel like I I call it emotional transference. I don't know if that's real or if I just made it up, but I call it I emotional like it. transference. I'm here for it. So that my tell example, me all about it. So what that is it? would be okay. So this is what I say to my clients: is Have you ever had a time where you've had just one of those days, nothing was going right, like? This morning, for example, in my life, we had yet another argument about what shoes, shoes we're going to wear. Shoes! And then we the could goddamn shoes. brush our fucking hair. <laughs> and then every time in my head, we're going to be on time to school. And oh, every time we're never on time. We leave exactly when school starts. And yep. so then I think, God, I'm a shitty mom. These teachers probably think I'm a piece of shit. I just yelled at my daughter, so I'm a goddamn psycho. <laughs> Now I need to hold space for her emotions and remind her that I love her. And Even fucking apologize for the I'm trauma re- later in apologize life. Apologize <laughs> for the loud yelling that mommy did yet again. And then... You I'm know, glad you know your mornings go as well as mine. Every morning. And every Feels morning... so good. And to the point where I'm just like, okay. I'm going to hold space for my daughter's emotions. And I'm allowed to be sad too. And... <laughs> I'm frustrated, but I'm the grown up here. So I'm gonna go home grown and watch Frozen. You used to do this. <laughs> Show yourself. <laughs> so I'm just like, okay. <laughs> Show yourself. <laughs> Let me see who you are. <laughs> Show yourself. <laughs> that song. Oh, I ball uh, every time. Let's talk about that. God. Anyways, so then I'm like, okay. And then I get to work and I'm like late to work. And then I have like. A session that's difficult, but I'm holding space. And here I am like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm a good mom. Holding space. <laughs> I don't get my, you know, first lunch or second breakfast. Fuck, so What the fuck? So I'm hungry. And then... Then you become hangry. Yeah, and then I get these text messages about all the other things that are going on planning for Christmas. And I'm like, okay, like, it's fine. No big deal. And I'm taking it. I'm like taking them as they go. Taking the punches. Like, yeah, we got it. And then I get home and... Do you ever get, like, a day like that, Mm -hmm. but for you, the equivalent of all these scenarios for you, right? Sounds exactly the same. I mean, it's all the same. You guys go through it, right? Even if you don't have kids, you have days where you're like, shit, I overslept. Or everybody is demanding something from you. And, like, your day is just busier than anticipated. You're hungry. You're tired. Nothing you have on your agenda gets crossed off. And then you go home, and your husband says, or, or says or does something. Or partner. Just write and you're like, what in the actual fuck? And then you freak out. Mm-hmm. And it's, I call it the emotional transference. It was the thing that actually made you angry. Now, I'm not saying whatever your partner did didn't make you angry. But what I'm saying is, did that level of explosion match the situation? And that's where it's that unfinished emotion of whatever you didn't finish earlier in the day came out at the wrong person and this is what I think brings us to the topic today of it will come out a lot of times when we feel safest Mm -hmm. that's a lot of times when we try to quote unquote process our emotions meaning move our emotions to the end is when we feel safe a lot of uh, easy examples of that easy examples of that is when I have clients where they're like 
I have been out of this abusive relationship for this long and why am I having nightmares about this guy? Or why am I having flashbacks about this, this abuse that happened however long ago? I'm doing the best that I've ever been and now it's coming back? But that's because our brain is equipped to end our emotions the way we explained at the beginning of this episode is it's equipped to move it to the end in ways of dreaming, in ways of crying, in ways of feeling the emotion. Flashbacks are our Mm. brain's way of thinking, quote unquote, we're in the memory because it's like, oh good, Jamie's calm now. So we're going to, we're going to digest these emotions of loss and abandonment so she can clean it up. We got to reach its end. Oh, Jamie, you're feeling happy? Yeah. Let's throw well, fuck you, you <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> and so it, it's all because our brain wants to heal, but it cannot if it does not feel safe. Which, actually, oddly enough, so our body does the same thing yeah. when it comes to getting sick. If we are go, 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 our body will not allow us to get sick. And, and I, I know this because there was one time I was pregnant with Juno. And I'm not even going to say allow us because someone had told me that she was like the sickest she had ever been. But she had to go and speak in front of a whole room full of people. She's like, I could not back out. And she's like, I don't know what it was, but my body like shut everything off. I was fine, presented, mm-hmm. and then went right back to being sick yeah. afterwards. Yeah. I had this really big presentation that I had to do. It was the first time I had ever presented on genograms and some other bullshit. I don't even fucking know. (laughs) Something I was supposed to be an expert on. (laughs) Right. You know, whatever the fuck. I was seven months pregnant with Juno. Mm -hmm. Maybe six months. I legit, (laughs) just before this, was like... I'm either going to pee my pants or vomit. Like I knew it was <laughs> one way or the other. Cause I was coughing so much Oh yeah, that it was one or the other. And I was like, okay, what do I choose? Cause there was no trash can. Do I choose to pee my pants or vomit all over the floor and have to clean it up? This is what's going through my mind in the bathroom stall yeah. at my job. <laughs> right. I chose to pee my pants sure, and I vomit agree. in the toilet. Cause I felt like that was easier to clean up. So now I'm texting my husband um, I'm wearing a dress. I don't have any underwear on. Can you bring some in a lunch bag for me and pretend like it's my lunch that I forgot? <laughs> he didn't get there before my presentation. So full on commando. Best. Fuck, like people raved about the way I talked about genograms. I can't replicate that to save my <laughs> you fucking life. You blacked out a little, but I apparently did. you did it. But apparently I did yeah. such a great job. And my body just shut down right. and didn't like, well, shut down in the yeah. way that I didn't right. feel the you sickness. Didn't your pants, yeah. But it's like the adrenaline, yeah, all of it. Your it's fascinating. Was, yeah. But it's all just, it's helpful for people to know when it, when, because that's what I think discourages clients when things, like, especially in therapy, a lot of times when, and I warn clients, I say when things are going really, really good, pay attention to your sleep and dreams. And pay attention to what triggers you because sometimes you are often easily triggered when you are doing really well and it's because your brain is moving through these emotions. It's saying, sweet, we're in a safe place now. We can finally digest that one time that this scary thing happened or that three-year-long relationship of bullshit. Like, what the fuck were we doing? that bad job. How hard you know, was that? That's why I. it's a, the emotional transference that I think we experience of we, we just happened to feel safe and we took it out on the wrong thing. Speaking of the um, emotions, like focusing on those annoyances, I would love to do an episode on annoyances and what they're really telling us because I think so often we dismiss them and think the other person is to blame and everyone around us is to blame. That's a theme of a lot of today's therapy sessions. It, it, that always seems to happen. But, and in fact, it's so funny that you say healing happens with safety because honestly, over the past six months, I've had those crazy dreams. Mm -hmm. I've had all these like 
blow-ups happen. My relationship with my husband has been up and down and up and down and up and down over probably the last few years. And now it makes sense that it's probably my fucking psychotic self. He's Just, got his own stuff. Let's go ahead and throw that out there he's too. He's not but, perfect. <clears throat> Just so but, you know, Joel, know your place. I mean, I legit lost my shit on him. I don't know. Sometime this week. Maybe it was last week too. <laughs> Maybe yesterday. I think it happened twice. I don't know. I've blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't me. That was rough. You know that meme where it's like, that wasn't me. That was Patricia. From... <laughs> From that one movie about multiple personalities. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> that reminds me of. That was Patricia. Shit, maybe. But I, in fact, we had a really great conversation not too long ago um, where I, we needed to reconnect, right? And I started crying. And it was this whole thing about, like, I'm so afraid of not being accepted. By the world, by people I love, because if I'm not accepted, then I'm not enough. And if I'm not enough, then they're not going to be there for me and they're going to leave me. And it was this whole underlying pain and trauma that obviously I had thought that I had processed. But how do you process Mm -hmm. a lifetime of a parent who has schizophrenia and you have no idea what reaction you're going to get. I mean, that's not something you just unfold in one fucking moment. Right. It comes out in various ways of learning about yourself. And the more Mm -hmm. you learn about yourself, the more you learn where you aren't as strong as you should be or Mm -hmm. aren't as accepting as you should be or aren't Mm -hmm. as brave as you should be or whatever that looks like. And so even though that abusive relationship for your client, they might be having dreams now or two years from now, might it might be unfolding in weird ways in their relationship with a safe person, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean it's not going to still come out right. in a relationship with their child where they're going to have to be like, I'm so sorry that I, that I yelled at you or right. Right. it... <laughs> But it becomes easier with time. I think that's where clients get discouraged. It gets you too, quicker back. Is, it's the idea mm-hmm. of, okay, well, if we always have emotions and I'm going to feel afraid again or I'm going to feel unsafe again, the, the, the purpose of processing the emotions is you no longer do the emotional transference. You instead, you finish your emotion to its end. So then let's say I do come home and my partner legitimately does something that was frustrating. I can say... After I, let's let's say in this perfect world, I had digested my rough day and like the shoes dilemma with my daughter, right? And then my partner says something or does something that is kind of annoying you or can frustrating. It. I can respond to the level of annoyance and say, oh, that's really irritating, but I'm going to do this now. Rather than, why would you say that? You know, and just like explode. Is that your level of annoyance? Because mine is usually a lot more loud and high pitched. Why would you say that? <laughs> are you like, why would you say that? No, is that... <laughs> I don't know. There are some people. Let's add, I, okay, well, then that's like... where my husband needs to chime in. My husband will say, though, because I've done the work that I've done, he's like, you're just really calm. You just, you don't yell it anymore as much anymore and the times that I do yell he even is just like you're right like because because I'll say it in a calm enough manner where he's like yeah I you're right well I need to do some more and fucking so, work but, so but hypno I know. hypnotherapy so should we do a live let's hypnotherapy let's schedule a session? session Angie we gotta clean your shit up let's do a live you're one welcome Joel for Look. fixing your wife oh fuck off and so <laughs> <laughs> but then that's where Again, you you will experience new emotions again, but it will match the intensity of what is happening, of the stimulus that's happening. Well, I think the biggest benefit of processing your own emotions is then I can clearly draw that boundary between where I end mm-hmm. and you begin. Yes. And that, to me is huge because when a colleague doesn't turn in their 
paperwork on time and it affects my ability to reach a deadline. I'm not so fucking pissed off at that colleague that they're fucking asshole and they just fucking do this shit on fucking purpose. Like, why the hell? Right? I can recognize... (laughs) Yeah, colleague. Yeah, colleague. I can recognize they might... They might have their own stuff and I can actually perhaps feel compassion for them because I might know what that feels like to be overwhelmed with life. And maybe I am then willing to take a burden off of them because I know how to do said paperwork. Yeah. And that helps them heal faster. Right. Right? Because it's all it's all this team. It's just it's, a give and take. Yeah. It is. And it doesn't disrupt the validity of your frustration. Right. You can say, oh, I'm so frustrated. But My why? colleague did this. But why? And you can say, I'm going to sit with this frustration and allow myself to be frustrated. And... I can simultaneously acknowledge the existence that my colleague, maybe they're having a really tough time keeping up with their workload and they just are not up to par right now. Or maybe their wife has cancer. And, and I'm like, oh, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated and I understand that you have this and I can hold both of those ideas and they're both right. It's not a matter of I'm right, they're wrong, they're right, I'm wrong. It's Oh, this is frustrating. Instead of being a victim. And then I move on. Or victimizing. Well, and even with my daughter this morning, because even in my head, I was telling myself this as I'm like, remember, I love you even though mama yells sometimes. (laughs) But (laughs) (laughs) But even in my head this morning, I was just like, gosh, but what am I actually mad at? I'm mad that we're not on time. Why am I mad that we're not on time? Because they could judge you. Because... I felt like I was being not a good mom. And why am I upset and stick scared that people think I'm not a good mom? Because I don't want to be not good enough. And I don't want mm-hmm. people to think that I'm not perfect and think that something is wrong with me. And who is at the bottom of all this? At the bottom of it is all a reflection of me. Is You know, we actually, my son wanted to make smoothies. And I said, sure, buddy, let's make smoothies. We probably shouldn't have made smoothies. And I probably shouldn't have stopped for donuts. And I probably should have made sure I knew where my daughter's brush was because we spent like a good 10 minutes looking for it to brush her hair. A lot of these things came back on the fact that I made conscious decisions that led us to be late. So me yelling at my daughter and saying, why can't you put your shoes on? Yes, that did exist and that is frustrating. But she is not to blame for why we were late. It was a variety of factors. And now I know, now I've learned, probably shouldn't make smoothies. No, hold on. I'm going to stop you. I'm <laughs> going to stop you. probably should just hold, on. hold space I want for to what stop I'm you capable of. Because that whole scenario, you said you going to dropping them off late yeah. means that you're not a good mom. Now, I would go ahead and argue that point. Your fucking two, almost three-year-old wanted to make smoothies, and you're like, fuck yeah, girl. It. Fuck yeah, dude. Let's do, do it. it. Your kids wanted donuts, and you said... That's a hard yes every time. Every fucking time. And you said yes. Yeah. So, yes. Because of the pressures that society puts on us, because of the unhealed wounds that we all carry. And I think that is my issue with trauma is that we all have unhealed wounds. But I would argue you're the fucking best mom. Best mom ever because you let me make a smoothie and I got a fucking donut. Well, and the stuff that I focused on because again I was frustrated. So my mind because you're letting society right. My mind focused on oh we couldn't do this. She also had a poop that takes forever. It does take forever. All these things and so my focus was oh if you did this if you did this if you did this. But look at that. Mm. Listen to those statements that has. That's me putting the blame on, first of all, a child. Mm -hmm. Second of all, like, because whose responsibility is it to get the kids to school on time? You know, it's not the child's fault. It's, you know, yes, they do things that are frustrating, but is that me just trying to force control and say that, well, I'm, I'm perfect 
Nothing I did was wrong this morning. I'm sorry. Nothing I did to contribute to this I do problem. feel like you did say that in yeah. our trailer. Well, I am perfect. <laughs> okay. And listen to Angie's shrink show of a life. <laughs> Angie has a shrink show of a life. I'm perfect. That still is true. However, in the realm of my children. In my perfection, I, I sometimes lose control. I know. But every once in a while, I may derail just. Just a scotch. <laughs> but we always just rein it back in. But it's, again, it's how much are we projecting this, like, because my thing is, quote, unquote, control. Mm. And so I always fo- focus on you, 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 because I can't control that. So then I'm like, of course we're late because of this. Rather than hold up the mirror and say, mm. you also looked at the time and consciously said, it's 840 we'll make a smoothie. Like, (laughs) you know, we only have to be at school in 20 minutes. Haven't brushed hair. No shoes are on. I can make a smoothie in 30 seconds. Watch me go. And so it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, why do you blame all these things? But again, because I, I, we all make mistakes, held space for the emotions, we digested it. I just like to tell myself I'm teaching my daughter how to hold space for emotions (laughs) and my son. I'm just like, "Uh uh-huh. I mean, if I don't give them anything stressful to deal with, how are they going to learn how to confront the world? I'm going to need to give them a reason to go to therapy as a grown-up. And this is one of the reasons. they got to heal their shit to be stronger. December 7th. I did tell tell a student today because he was going through a really, really difficult time. And it it was like this moment of like, oh, like he and I really connected. We've connected before. He's like, He could be my child. But I did say, if we don't have shadows, we can never discover our light. Because if it's light all the time, we don't realize there are shadows. So we have to have those shadows, those dark moments, those, those things that we would rather avoid and not see. Right. So that we can shine brighter. Right. I mean, think about a dark room. What do you do? You turn a flashlight on. And if a flashlight doesn't work stronger, what what do you do? You go get a brighter flashlight. Right. That, I think, is kind of a takeaway that I really want folks to understand is trauma isn't a curse. It isn't a victimization. One thing I have learned within my life is... My trauma, my journey, I chose this. My soul chose this. Right. Regardless of whatever you believe, yeah, I know what I believe. Yeah. My soul chose this life mm-hmm. so that I could transform that shadow and shine brighter mm-hmm. and brighter and brighter and brighter. Mm-hmm. And to me, that is incredibly power, mm-hmm. powerful to transform the shadow to the light. Right. Well, and with that, that's where I always tell people healing, it's a spectrum again. I love life on a spectrum. I will live and breathe until I find something that fits better because this is all I know. Mm-hmm. But because of that, that's why grief and every emotion lasts forever because... Mm-hmm. The brighter your light shines, the deeper you will go to the other side. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, you know, you... (laughs) I'm trying to think of an example, but... An onion, like like in Shrek. Yes, but to know the depth of how sad... Just like your stepson Beckett's sadness of his mom passing will change throughout life, but the depth will grow... The brighter his light shines, the happier he feels life, he will still have that deep of sadness because it's sad that his mom doesn't get to see him graduate, you know, him get married. Mm -hmm. That is sad. And that's deeper than this other loss of his mom missing like sports or just day-to-day achievements. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is, is the brighter your light shines, you have that perspective to shine onto the darkness. It doesn't yeah. mean it 
because I have clients where they're like, I thought we've processed my parents and like my issues with them, but here we are again. And I say, yes, but you processed it in half a session versus several sessions because you have the experience and knowledge of what you've come from and you, the more you grow positively on one side or you know, with love and compassion, the deeper you will grow with sadness and grief. That's why we have to have happiness with sadness. That's so why do people, in your opinion, because I have my own... Let's see if it matches. Well, I'm Let's curious. See right. Yeah. I'm curious <laughs> why you think... Why are people... Sorry. Sorry, folks. Why are people so afraid to confront the depths of pain that they feel? I think it's a variety of reasons. It could be a lot of what we discussed today. It could be they're, they're already dissociating, so they're not acknowledging it exists. It could be it's, it's, um, it makes them feel too vulnerable. They're not in a safe enough place to do so. It, and I think it, again, comes back to the spectrum of they haven't grounded themselves in where they are currently at mm -hmm. with the brightness of their flashlight mm -hmm. to look at the depth of that darkness. Mm -hmm. Because if you are not secure in where you sit, so easy examples are like, do you, do you feel half, do you love yourself? Like, I would do say a lot you, of people who have gone through trauma probably don't because like, the trauma has you, impacted yeah, that. Do you feel like you deserve love? You deserve safety and you deserve nothing but unconditional love. It's risky. Right? Think and about if, a scary room. If yeah. I were to go, okay, let's just, for a weird minute here, let's think about like a, a, like a, a 1950s mental health institution. Okay? Yeah. Give me a flashlight. Tell me to go explore that motherfucker. Mm -hmm. You think I'm going to be like, oh yeah. Peace out, let's go, yeah. right? I'm gonna be like, oh my God, because I'm waiting for the scary clown around every motherfucking corner. Right. Because that's yeah what I expect. Because if you're not grounded in, in the safety of what you currently have, it is too scary to explore the depths. Mm -hmm. So I think that is why it's important to know like, who you are, where you are, and, and what resources you have. Mm. And that's emotionally, that's physically, that's mentally. There's layers to it. That's just you and your own spiritual being and like how you define that. But if you don't have that, you will not explore the depths of that darkness because you can't, it's a spectrum. You can't, you can only go as deep as one side goes. You, you can only go as, it's kind of like death if it's a stranger who passes away, how sad are you? Versus right. if it was your best friend that you can literally in. turn to whenever you needed and they died, what is the depth of grief and sadness you would have compared to a stranger that you hear about, right? It, it has to go as deep as you have had it. it will, the sadness will go as deep as the happiness. The darkness mm. will go as deep as the lightness. And unless it's established on one side or the other, you can't get the other side. So if we think of trauma and that that vulnerable pain, um, what did you call it earlier? God, I loved how you explained it. Um, emotional... Emotional transference. Emotional transference. Mm -hmm. Well, that's us throwing it out. Us throwing out. emotions. Oh, shoot. I can't remember. But... <laughs> if we think of it like a 19, and I know this, this may sound absurd to some, but, um, to others, it will make sense. If we think of it like that 1950s mental health psycho babble place, let's, let's say that is your childhood trauma and you have to explore room by room. You doesn't mean you have to go running in there into the darkest depths and then work your way out mm -hmm. of this scary place. It means you go into the foyer 
or foyer if you're really fucking cool. Ooh, look at you, fancy. Yeah. Maybe it starts as the foyer and then it becomes the foyer because you become the boss of that motherfucking you clean space. clean that shit up. Right. So you clean it up and now that has lights. Mm-hmm. And no more has cobwebs. So then you open another door and you go in there and you replace the light bulbs and you, you clean the out light. the cobwebs. Yeah. And it is, it is literally just a, a home makeover like you would see on HGTV <laughs> or whatever channel would have the fucking, like sci-fi, have the scary fucking oh, ghost yeah. shit, right? But that's really what you're doing with your life and it doesn't have to be so intimidating. You just bite off one chunk at a time. Yeah. So wait, do you agree? Is that why people don't look at their darkness? Going back to your question. For me personally, I think a lot of people don't look at their darkness because of their own self-doubt in their ability to be strong enough to handle what they discover. Yeah. I think that matches. Yeah. So then, key takeaways. What are our key takeaways of trauma? <laughs> trauma is, is intertwined with emotions. And you should feel your emotions, meaning maybe you don't feel it all the time at work and, and shit or have a nervous breakdown in front of your kids. But if you need to cry, cry. If you want to be mad, be mad. Well, and that's the thing sad, too is... If you want to be happy, be happy. I have coworkers who say that they... They're like, I, I started crying and I have no idea why. So I, like, I stop, like, I shouldn't be crying. So they stop themselves. And mm-hmm. I'm like... But Don't stop yeah. yourself. I always say crying, laughter, shaking, like what we associate with like obviously like happiness, sadness, nervousness, anger. Do that. Allow yourself to do that. Did you know that humans are the only animals in the animal kingdom that don't shake or vibrate after an intense situation in, a, in at least our culture and country? Because every animal in the animal kingdom after like they've escaped a predator or they've just completed a hunt, they do some level of shaking or vibrating in their natural habitat. But humans, think of you don't tremble with fear because you don't want to be weak or mm. you don't want to, to look weak so you don't shake when you're scared or sad. And think about our culture and how often do we act mm. like we're tough and I'm good. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's all fine. It's fine. the grit of your teeth. But so that's why I tell my clients where they, they're anxious, they shake, they rock their knee, they like are physically trembling in session. And I'm like, yeah, do it. I'm always like, get up and walk around if you want. Like, I don't care. Get it out of your body because we are equipped. We are animals. We are equipped to get this out of our body whether it's through laughter. That's why sometimes people laugh when they're scared or nervous or sad. That's I have why an example of that. People cry and they don't know why. Mm-hmm. They are moving emotions. That is your body physically saying, I can't fucking hold this emotion in anymore. So I'm going to work its way to its end, whether you want to or not, motherfucker. I so legit comes. was just talking to somebody about, and, and I still do this, but not to this extent. Fucking. I don't know, there's there's something about your teenage years and your early 20s, right? There's a handful of folks that really love hard, like, rock. Yeah. You know? I was one of those folks, right? And I fucking loved it. Yeah. But there is something that I think people don't understand that is so healing Mm -hmm. about that music. Because it is, like, guttural. It is right you think about when you're when your stomach is upset yeah when you feel nauseous it feels so good to vomit Mm -hmm. that's the feeling of like i am releasing all of that pain Mm -hmm. and then you go to those concerts and there's those mosh pits going yeah it's like if you're gonna do a mosh pit do a safe one but (laughs) even now i will turn on (laughs) i'll turn on like African drum music in my basement sometimes Mm -hmm. and seriously like wildly dance like nobody is watching 
And your kids are watching. Right. <laughs> and it is incredibly healing. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. So that's another takeaway. Move your body. Move your that's body. That's what exercise, I think, does. That's what walking does. I think that's why gay folks are so happy because they go to fucking clubs all the time and they let the music inside their body. Yeah. So allow emotions to happen. No emotions always have an end. It doesn't mean you're never going to feel emotions again because we're human. Feeling emotions is, is, you're human. It's part of the experience. It means that you're human. That was the sentence. It took a minute. It, it really is. is. Like, I, I don't, I don't know what yeah. anybody's Feeling belief of, is, yeah. but I don't think any other alien races feel human emotions. Yeah. And so that's why, yeah, key takeaways. Feel your emotions. Give yourself permission to feel them however it comes out. Whether you cry, whether you laugh, whether you talk about it, whether you dance in your basement to African music. Cry to Frozen. <sighs> Or Frozen 2. Gets you every time. Sing the songs. Cry in yeah. your car. I cry in my car so often in the morning just right. to an incredible song. And I'm just like, oh my God, this yeah. is so beautiful. And I mean, listener too. In, invite us into your conversation. How do you define trauma? You know, what fits for you? What doesn't fit for you? Because this is obviously our definitions of not only emotions, but trauma and how you process it and the mm. subjective experience of it. But we don't know. We haven't gone through what you've gone through and you have. So tell us. Yeah. Oh, we Send haven't done our email. mugs. Also our mugs. Mine is tough as a mother. Meaning, I think in order to be a tough mother, you have to have cleaned up your emotions so you can hold your emotions and process them in front of your children so then they can learn how to do the same. And I think a lot of times children are the best example of whether or not we've cleaned up our shit because they are nothing but fucking mirrors. So if you haven't cleaned it up, <sighs> it's probably triggering as fuck, your kids. But my kids are delights because I'm a delight. So <laughs> my kids are perfect because I'm perfect. Keep manifesting. <laughs> Keep manifesting that shit. On to you, Angie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. To relieve stress, we do yoga. Just kidding. We drink wine in our yoga pants. Okay. So. She's you just peeled. Oh, I peeled. peeled. Uh, sorry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Deep thoughts, Angie. <laughs> Here's my thoughts. I didn't know what we were talking about when I chose the mug. I just chose it. But I think this is I think this fits because to relieve stress, we do yoga. I think a lot of people do exercise. Yeah. Do find physical releases such as dancing, such as burpees. Burpees like you like a psycho. Um Normal. and I think that that's healthy. But I also think that just kidding, we drink wine in our yoga pants. I think it's okay to be playful. I think it's okay to not take yourself so seriously. It's okay to be like, I'm such a fitness buff, but I also can have a good time. And it doesn't mean I have to push myself to this extreme. You know, we get this idea of I have to exercise 30 minutes a day or a an hour and a half a day and do all these things. And if I don't, I'm a failure. Oh, my God. You're only adding to your trauma. Calm your tits. Yeah. And drink some wine in your motherfucking yoga pants. That and might be a workout. An emotional workout. An emotional workout. And that's okay. Thank and with you. that, we love you. We and love you. And thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> if you think we're cool. Or even if you don't. Please like or subscribe so you'll stay up to date on all things The Shrink Show. Feel free to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at The Shrink Show. You can also visit our website at theshrinkshowpodcast.com to check out some of our merch, submit your episode topic requests, tell us a funny story, or even donate money or gin to the cause. Thank you for choosing to spend a portion of your life with us. And remember, don't take yourself too seriously. Life is all a giant shrink show. A Huda Media Production. Side effects of listening to this podcast may include side aches or snorting from laughter, impromptu jazz hands, nodding in agreement even though you might be listening alone, an occasional, you said it girl, and mild cases of existential dread. This podcast is strictly for entertainment and informative purposes only and is not intended or implied to diagnose, treat, or otherwise substitute for professional mental health, medical, legal, or other advice. Thank you.